So I handed back um, the exams. Hopefully you either got yours back today or Friday. If not, you can get them from me after class. Um, one thing that you know, I kind of mentioned on Friday was you can start doing these, uh, whatever questions you got wrong, you know, you've got the exam. I put the answer key up there under this exam two files. So you can kind of open this up, you kind of see whichever form you had, and then it tells you what those correct answers are. Right? Um, if you think for some reason, because I, I tried to check a few of them um, that I thought maybe were suspicious uh, to make sure you had the right form kind of written down in your exam, I can double check that for you since I still have all the old exams. That's why I take both of them. Um, but I, I, I didn't pick up any for this section, I believe. But if you do have a question, I can double check that for you. Otherwise, whichever form you have kind of written down in your exam, that'll be the one you look at the answer key for. You can figure out which questions you got wrong. Hopefully that matches up with what your score is. Each question was worth five points. So I got those exam scores uploaded to Canvas. So currently I'm treating exam two for everybody as though it was your worst exam. That's mostly true. Um, but if it's not, after the corrections are done, I'll kind of get this updated so that your best exam is being weighted 30 and your worst exam is being weighted 20%, right? But until I have those corrections and update the exam scores, I'll kind of, just for the sake of right now, kind of treat that exam score as 20%, probably kind of giving you like a worst case scenario if you don't do the corrections, okay? Hopefully everybody does the corrections. And like I, I posted on the announcement on Canvas, um, I, and I think in class, I was still wishy-washy on it, but I'm gonna give half of the points back. So. Each question was worth five points. So if you do it, you do the correction, you can get two and a half points back, right? I think the example I gave was like, if you got a 50, you could get a 75 if you do all the corrections and get them correct. Right? Also, you've got a bunch of different resources. I'm a resource during this week. Reach out, make sure if you've got questions, excuse me, questions on some of them. Make, I mean, I'm, I can talk to you about it and kind of help you make sure you can get as many points back as possible. Um, but when I say rework them, just to reiterate, that doesn't mean tell me the answer is C. That means if I ask you say for the test statistic, show me the test statistic equation, plug in the values, show me the work that leads you to arrive at the correct answer is C, okay? So I wanna see all the work there in order to kind of get credit for reworking that, that problem, okay? If everybody does that, the average would be, well, usually when I try to target like a 75, I think I played a, I did a hypothetical, I think it was like, between 76 and 77, the new average would be if everybody does these test corrections. And like I said, I'm a resource. I want you guys to get all the points back, all your points back, right? Or not all, I guess I can't do that, but half of those points back, right? I want that average to be right there around a 75. I've done this before, so I kind of know sometimes in the second exam, I usually have something like this kind of ready to go. Okay? And this will help us kind of learn, right? You're just reworking. So it's gonna instill like these hypothesis testing principles we're going to continue to do it here for the next week and a half or so. All right. Any questions about the, the corrections here? Okay. Um, also, you can turn them in in class, like a handwritten version of them. Or by the end of the day on Friday, which is when they're due, you can upload them here to this exam two corrections on Canvas, right? So that can be PDF, scan PDF. You can upload pictures there. Um, if you really want to type it out in Word, you can do that. I feel like that would take a lot longer than just doing it by hand, but, you know, well, whatever your preference is, okay? Um, one thing I want to mention is if you do want to turn in a physical copy, it would have to be in Wednesday's class. Unfortunately, my wife has to have surgery this week, so I'll be out Thursday and Friday. Um, you can upload it to Canvas. You can slide it under my door Thursday or Friday if you want to still turn in a physical copy. Um, WB119 is my office number. So if you want to slide it under the door, if they have a physical copy as opposed to uploading it, that's fine. I just, uh, I won't be here Thursday or Friday, which means Friday's class, we won't be meeting. And I'll put up probably not a video quite as long as class would be, but about 40 minutes of kind of walking through some two population hypothesis testing, which is what we're going to start next class. Okay. So if you want to ask me questions about these corrections, you're going to have to do it before Wednesday's office hours are over, right? You can ask me via email, but if you physically want to stop by, I won't be in my office Thursday or Friday this week, but I will still be available via email. So if you do have some last minute questions on your corrections those two days, I'll still be responding to emails. Um, okay.
Any questions for me? Yeah, I don't usually like to cancel class, but you know, pick her up and drop her, drop her off, pick her up, maybe get a good video out of it. I don't know. We'll see. So, um, but if there's no questions. We will kind of pick up where we left off, which is I just getting a little bit better understanding of critical values, right? So we said critical values are these threshold number of standard deviations away. And the example that we looked at on Friday was threshold number of standard deviations from a standard normal distribution. So we were saying they were a threshold Z value. Well, if we're finding a threshold number of standard deviations away, we can still do it when we have to use the student T as well. It's just now it's a threshold number of standard deviations away that represents a T value. The same idea. Okay. So we've got kind of this problem which says, you know, a leading smartphone has a battery life of four hours. A manufacturer claims that this new phone lasts twice as long. So really what we're saying there, if we're going to try to identify our null alternative right away, it's going to last twice as long as the current phone. That means that it's going to be greater than what? Two times four. So longer than eight hours of battery life. That's what the manufacturer is claiming. So that's what we're going to test for. We assume the opposite is true. Right. And that's going to be our null alternative hypothesis. So basically it's going to work through this problem together. So if I've got a greater than sign in my alternative hypothesis, what type of tilt test do I have? Here? Yeah, greater than or right tail test. Now, the other piece of information I was given, I have to write these down so I don't forget all of them. We took a sample size of 30 phones. We found the mean battery life, 8.9. We found a standard deviation of 2.1. And if I want to do this hypothesis test at a 90% confidence level, my alpha would be what? 90% confidence, alpha should just be 0.1. Okay. So whatever remains outside the confidence level in decimal form. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we've got our normal alternative, we've got a right tail test. Here's all the information that we need to find this test statistic, or in this case, a T statistic, right? because we only have a sample standard deviation. We don't know the population variance or the population standard deviation. We have to use that student T distribution. So the equation that we have for that was take the mean, subtract the assumed true mean, divide by the square root of the sample variance over my sample size, this denominator representing kind of that standard deviation of my sample means, right? We said if we wanted to, we could break this down into parts, but we can, we can do it all at one time. So for that test statistic, it's really just going to be a matter of plugging in the values that we were given in the problem, right? So my sample mean is 8.9. My assumed true mean comes from that null term hypothesis, that's eight. And then the square root of, well here, all we had was the standard deviation. So when I plug that in, I've got S, right? I need to make sure that I'm still squaring it to get the variance and then divided by that sample size of 30. So just looking at this and remembering that this denominator represents a standard deviation, what should be true about the sign of my test statistic here? I found sample evidence that was above the assumed true mean. So remember, this test statistic represents the number of standard deviations away from that assumed true mean. If I'm a certain number of standard deviations above it, this should be positive, right? Sure enough, if I calculate it, I get, uh, I think it's 2.35. I remember correctly if we get that entered into our calculator. So here's my test statistic. The next step is going to be what we're trying to get some more practice of, which is looking up these critical values, right? So I'm now dealing with a student T distribution. I've got a right tail test. So I want the critical value or the threshold T value that gives me this alpha of 0.1 in this right tail. Once I find that critical value, the rejection region for the right tail test is the area to the right. Of it. And that rejection region is just a nice visual so that we don't have to worry as much about the mathematics. I'll show you kind of the math formula here once we kind of start working through it. But I always think the visual is a little bit easier to deal with. Okay. So I know the area in this right tail that I want is 0.1. With a student T distribution, what other piece of information do I need? And we did it for confidence intervals. 
yeah, my degrees of freedom. So that was just going to be n minus one. So that's pretty easy here. 29. At this point, we're going to go to our table and student t table, and we can figure out that if we want the area in that upper right tail to be 0.1, and that's what that t table tells us, add a degrees of freedom of 29. The T value that would give that to us is 1.311, or the threshold number of standard deviations away that we're gonna set is 1.311. If we see sample evidence that corresponds to being even further from that assumed true mean than 1.31 standard deviations, we're okay rejecting. Well, we found a test statistic of negative 2.5, So my test stat here was 2.35. That's, if I plot this against my critical value, that's clearly gonna be in my rejection region. So I can reject when alpha is 0.1 or, or with 90% confidence. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Any questions on that? I keep moving, I'm gonna add a couple of wrinkles to this. Okay. So what if instead, hmm, what do I want to do here? Okay. So what if instead we had the exact same setup, but now I want to test against all three alphas, right? Well, it's actually pretty easy to do. And if I plot it out, it won't be too bad. So here's the critical value for an alpha of 0.1, critical value for an alpha of 0 0.05, and critical value for an alpha of 0 0.01. We said this kind of corresponded to the certain significance and confidence levels. So the significance level was just the percentage form of alpha. And the confidence level was kind of whatever the remaining percentage would be from our significance level. Or we could work back from alpha. We did that for confidence intervals, things like that. All right, so this is kind of be our setup. For a right tail test, our rejection regions here are going to be anything to the right. So now it's just a matter of looking these up. Well. We already said our degrees of freedom was 29, just n minus one. So I can look up these three different alpha values or the three different areas I want in the tail pretty quickly from that student t distribution. I go up here, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01, those were the three alphas that I wanted. At degrees of freedom of 29, these corresponding t values are right here. So here I've got what? 1.311. 1.699, and this is what, 2.462. If I go over to that other column. Now, me being zoomed in, it's hard to remember like what the column headings are, but if you had it kind of pulled open in front of you, it might be a little bit, a little bit easier, or if you had a physical copy of it. So we've got our three critical values pretty quickly. Now it's just a matter of plotting that test statistic of 2.35. So on a number line, right? That test statistic, we're just plotting against these other values, would be somewhere in between these two, right? Somewhere in between 2.4 and 1. Point about 7. So can I reject at the 10% significance level? Well, my test statistics very clearly in that rejection region. What about the 5% significance level? Well, it's in the rejection region there as well. What about the 1% level? Well, it's not quite in the rejection region there, so we would fail to reject. Okay. So this is why I think the critical value approach is a little bit easier because you really have this nice visual for is that test statistic in the rejection region. Now, if you don't want to draw out the visual, we said last class that this is how we would check to see if we reject no matter what type of tail test. Right. The idea there was, you know, left tail, right tail, one we're dealing with negative, one we're dealing with positive numbers. So, like, I can't say greater than or less than applies to all. So, an easier way to do it is just think about if I take the absolute value of that test statistic and the absolute value of my critical value, if my test statistic, which represents if my sample evidence is a further number of standard deviations away from an assumed true value than this threshold amount I set, then I'm okay rejecting. Right, but taking the absolute value deals with the fact that if it was negative, right, 
a smaller number since a larger negative value is technically like less than, right? Taking the absolute value deals with that fact so we don't ever have to kind of worry about this sign. It's always if the absolute value of my critical value is less than the absolute value of my test statistic, I'm okay rejecting. Now, last class, we were calling it a Z statistic because it was a test statistic from a standard normal distribution. So today, it'll be the same thing, but our test statistic comes from a student T, so we'll write it slightly differently, right? But it's the same idea. If our sample evidence corresponds to being a higher number of standard deviations away than this threshold amount that we set, then we're okay rejecting, which would apply here, right? Is 2.35 greater than 1.3? Yep, so we rejected. Is 2.35 greater than 1.69? Yeah, so we rejected. Is it greater than 2.46? No, so we failed to reject. So you can use the, the formula or you can use the, the nice visual. I always think the visual is a lot easier, but you know, everybody's a little bit different. Any questions over anything there? We don't just have to test against one alpha, we can do several at the same time. And really with that student T table, it's pretty easy to grab like the three different critical values, right? They're all gonna be on that same row. So, you know, if we're going to do one, we might as well do all three. Let me think what I'm going to do here. I think we're going to, first of all, sorry. Did everybody get this written down? We need a little bit more time with this. We're okay. So what would change if I had a left tail test with that previous example? I'm looking at my critical values. What would be true about those critical values? What's the only thing that would change if I was looking up these critical values for a left tail test? Symmetric distribution. So it'd be all these same values, but negative. Right? We said for a right tail test, positive critical values. For a left tail test, negative critical values. The reason why, because our standard normal and our student T are centered around zero. So the area to the left and right of zero would be 0.5. So if I want an area less than 0.5, it's going to have to be critical values are going to be above zero or positive. If I want the area in the left tail to be less than 0.5, I'm going to have to be looking at critical values that are negative. So right tail test, these positive critical values. Left tail test, if you're using the student T, you'd still look them up the same way. It's just you have to remember once you find these, it's going to be those values, but negative, right? They're on the other side of the distribution, okay? What about for a two tail test? It's a little bit trickier, right? Just kind of revisit this, and then we're going to take a look at how, how we do some of this in Excel. So for a two-tailed test, let's say we have that same alpha of 0.1 and the same degrees of freedom of 29, but now we've got a two-tailed test, right? How would I look up my critical values? Well, for a two-tailed test, remember, if this critical value represents a threshold number of standard deviations away, well, now, if I'm a certain number of standard deviations above or below, that's still, both of those go against the null. So I'm going to actually end up with a pair of critical values, same value, one positive, one negative. And with a two-tailed test, alpha is the total area, and this is sometimes how I write it. Alpha is the total area in your tail if you have one tail, tails if you have two, right? So that means that for a two-tailed test, each tail has half of alpha, so 0 0.05. So now when I go to look at my critical value, I'm gonna be looking up half of alpha, right? Because now I don't have all of alpha in the upper right tail, I only have half of it. So now when I go to the student T table, half of alpha was 0 0.05, at that degrees of freedom of 29, so 1.699 and negative 1.699 would be my critical values there, okay? So it's gonna be the same process. I'm just looking up a different um, area now because it's not all of alpha in this upper right tail, it's only half, okay? Sometimes we might see this written like, I've got a pair of critical values, right? Same value, one positive, one negative, okay? Any questions on that? So one point I wanted to make at this point, one point at this point. So I had the same alpha as before, but when it was a two-tailed test, if I think about where would my test statistic be? 
notice, yeah, I can still reject, right? It's still in that rejection region, but it's a little bit closer to my critical value than it was for the alpha 0.1 when I had a right tail test, right? 2.3 is about one away from 1.31. It's a little bit closer to 1. almost seven, right? So two tailed tests actually make it a little bit more difficult that we can reject the null, right? And the reasoning why is because now evidence on either side would go against that null hypothesis. Okay. So we're looking up critical values for a two-tailed test. We don't simply look up alpha, we look up half of alpha, right? Because we've got half of alpha in each tail now. We have two tails. <coughs> Excuse me. Any questions on that? We kind of jump into Excel here for a bit. Huh? All right, so let's go to Excel. If you go to the in-class data folder under files and go to this hypothesis testing blank folder. Okay. So if you open that up, you should have everything that I have here. I think the only difference is I sorted this for my earlier sections. So it shows all the, the youngest ages first, um, but everything else should be the same. We've got our sample mean which hopefully by this point, so first of all, let me set, set this up, I guess. So I've got this variable, I found this data set, I guess it's kind of interesting. Um, and it's got like uh, the age, so high school, middle school students and the age they first tried the e-cigarette. Right? So I, I've got, you know, the age they first tried uh, electronic cigarette or you know, whatever the cool name is for them that I, I don't know. So um, what we're gonna do is say, okay, look, is that age, that true population mean, or that true age when someone first kind of smokes you know, this tobacco product, is it anything different than 14.3? So instead, we'll assume the opposite is true, which is that it's exactly equal to that, right? So just above 14, right? We're gonna test for that average age. So you've got what type of tail test here? Not equal to sign the alternative. So somebody humor me. Thank you, right? A two-tailed test, right? A not equal to or a two-tailed test. Evidence on either side goes against that null, right? So uh, we know that we can calculate the test statistic. We kind of just worked through a problem like this, but it was a right tail test where this was our test statistic equation. So as long as I have that data, I can find the sample mean, the sample variance, and the sample size, and I'm using this assumed true value of 14.3, okay? So I'm gonna go over here. You know, I use the average function to find my sample mean. It's not that tough. Var.s, I found my sample variance. And then we also use the count function to find my sample size. Like we've done this up to this point quite, quite a few times. Hopefully we're getting familiar or comfortable with those equations. I'm gonna kind of write in just a notation to make this a little bit easier. So our sample size was N, our sample variance is S squared, our sample mean is this X bar, right? So I've got everything I need to calculate my test statistic. Now, there aren't equations that just calculate or built-in formulas that just calculate your test statistic in Excel. So at this point, we, we can only use Excel to be our calculator. Um, but you know, all the values are in there. So it makes it easy to just click on them and we can get a really precise test statistic. So I don't put parentheses when I write this out because you can clearly see everything in the numerator, but order of operations, we need to make sure that we're taking this difference first and then dividing it by what's ever in our denominator. So I'll take my sample mean minus that assumed true mean. Oops, I think the right direction, there we go. Then divide it by the square root right, which is SQRT in Excel, of my sample variance, <clears throat> excuse me, divided by my sample size, right? So all I'm doing is using Excel with my calculator, clicking on the cells where I have each of these four things. Now, I don't have to put this 14.3 in a cell, but I am going to so that I can show you that if you do use cell references, you can test against several different hypothesized true values very quickly, right? Any questions on that? Let's keep moving on. Okay. 
So I've got this test statistic of negative four, right? If we're starting to get used to test statistics and things like that, that's pretty far. Being four standard deviations away, it's starting, starting to get pretty far away, right? So I'm, you know, ahead of time, I might think I'm probably gonna reject, but I don't really know. I gotta figure out what my critical values are first. So we'll do the critical value approach first, and then I'll actually end up showing you the p-value approach as well. So we just found, the test statistic, which is what, negative 4.05 or something like that. And I believe I had, so I had a two-tailed test. I believe that the um, alpha is 0 0.01 here. I think it's the 99% confidence level. So I just worked through a problem that has a slightly different number. But remember, for a two-tailed test, I'm going to have a pair of critical values. Alpha is the total area in my tails. So each tail has half of alpha. This is like really similar to what we did for confidence intervals, right? We looked up half of alpha because we had two sides to the confidence interval. For a two-tailed test, we have two tails. So this is what, 0 0.01 over 2 or 0 0.005, okay? So what is my degrees of freedom going to be? What was the equation we had for that? Yeah, simply the sample size minus one. We had like 6,000 some observations. So my degrees of freedom is going to be pretty high here. So when I actually find my critical values, they should be pretty close to the critical values I would find if I use the standard normal distribution. Remember, as we get a higher sample size, that student T looks more and more like a standard normal distribution. But for right now, we want to find that value that gives us 0.005 in that lower left tail at our degrees of freedom of like 6,000 something minus one. Right? So how do we do that? Well, we're using, whenever we know the area, actually, I want this to be able to you see this, there we go. Whenever I know the area in my tail and I wanna find the corresponding either T or Z value, I'm working in the inverse, right? So T dot I and V, right? I'm using a student T distribution and I'm working in reverse. I know the area I want in that lower left tail. And that area is going to be alpha divided by two. Right, for my two-tailed test, it's gonna be half of alpha. Right. So you can't, I will show you that second. Yep. So right now I'll show you how to do it if we're using that t dot i and v, and then I'll show you if you use t dot i and v dot two t, it could save us a little bit of time. So I use this t dot i and v, it's gonna give me this t value that gives me alpha over two in that lower left tail, but I need to still tell it my degrees of freedom, which was my sample size, minus one. All that's going to do is just like I would in the table, it's going to go to that degrees of freedom of 6,271, which we can't do in the table, but Excel can because it can do the actual integration. It's almost like Excel has a good table stored up with every single degrees of freedom and every single area in the tail. So this should give us the negative critical value that we want. So what, negative 2.577? Well, for a two-tailed test, we have to remember, we have the same, we have a pair of critical values, which are the same value, but one's positive, one's negative. Okay. So what I would do on a two-tailed example, usually, you do this a couple ways. You could put, you know, some type of text next to it to indicate, oops, sorry, not equals, to indicate there's a positive and negative critical value. Or another way that I think is probably more preferred is, Use that absolute value. You know you want the same value for your other critical values. You just want it to be positive. So now you'll have kind of like shown you've got two critical values here. Same value, one positive, one negative. Any questions you want to see a cell again or what, what I did at a certain point? Okay with this for now? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so we've got our critical values. Now the visual is really nice. I can kind of see that my test statistic of negative four will be like way out here, very clearly in that rejection region, right? So I, I know I should be rejecting, but we can actually use the equation that we said earlier, which is if that absolute value of my critical value is less than the absolute value of my T or test statistic, then I should be rejected. So I'm gonna show you something in Excel that 
you can use um, when it comes to the, the first homework. I don't expect that you use it, but it's going to make your life a little bit easier when it comes to making these rejection decisions, especially when we get to linear regression, which will be the last kind of thing after hypothesis session we cover in the course. Oops, sorry. This is our one. So I want to introduce that to you now. So let's say I got down here and I want to use this if statement that's built into Excel. So what the if function does is it checks to see if something's true, comma, if it is, put this in the cell, comma, if it's not, put this other thing. So I'm going to say, well, what do I want to check to see if it's true? I want to see if the absolute value of my critical value is less than my absolute value of the test statistic. So ABS, right, absolute value of my critical value, which I had right there, right? Now it's blocking it out after I clicked on it, is less than the absolute value of my test statistic, right? That's why I want to check to see if that's true. If it is, I want to reject. So comma, put the word reject in there. Now, if I wanted to put a word in, I have to put quotation marks around it. Sometimes, um, you know, eventually we'll get to, I can, I might show you some stuff um, where we, you know, put like a one, if it's true, zero, if not, but you can put values in there and that you don't have to worry about using the parentheses. But here, if I want an actual text or word to be in there, I have to put quotation marks or quotation. Yeah, quotation marks, not parentheses, sorry, quotation marks around it. Right? And then comma, if it's not true, put in the phrase fail to reject, right? So now what this will do is it checks my critical value. It takes the absolute value. It says, okay, if that's less than the absolute value of my test statistic, comma, put the word reject. And then comma, if it's not, put the word fail to reject, right? So, I mean, you don't, like I said, you don't have to do this, but it's a like, nice, easy way. If I start changing things, it'll automatically update it. Okay, so notice we should be rejecting here. We kind of already determined that. But let's say, I don't know, can I reject it with 90% confidence, which corresponds to an alpha of 0.1, right? Well, because I was referencing this alpha cell, I can play around with alpha and everything should update. So notice, okay, yeah, I can still reject at 0.1. Well, that makes sense. If I can reject it with 99% confidence, I should be able to reject it with 90. But we can play around with alpha and it'll update things. We can also play around with this hypothesized true value. Now, this is kind of interesting that I look, I'm assuming that it's exactly equal to 14.3. And I found a sample mean of 14.2. That doesn't seem like it's that inconsistent with what I assume. So how can I reject the null with like, you know, pretty clearly, I, that test says it's pretty far from the critical value. Well, look at my sample size. My sample size is huge, right? So notice if my sample size goes up here, what happens to this fraction? It goes down, right? I'm dividing by a larger number. And then if my denominator of my test statistic goes down, my test statistic will go up, making it more likely I can reject the null, right? So these really large sample sizes, I could see sample evidence that's like 0.1 away from that assumed true value. But if my standard deviation is 0 0.025, that would be four standard deviations away, right? So even though I find a small difference with a really high sample size, that might be a really large number of standard deviations, okay? Which happens to be the case here, okay? So we've got a really large sample size here. I'll play around with this and we'll kind of revisit this idea in just, just a second, but um, I wanna make sure. Are there any questions at this point before I can move? And I'll show you the 2T here in just a second. Are we okay with where we're at up to this point? Want to see a cell again or? Okay. So you can use this t.inv.2t function, right? Now it saves you one step, which is it divides your alpha by two. The only reason I don't usually use it is like just to get confused with what this probability means. So like before that t.inv was the probability, but it was referencing the area in the left tail. With the dot 2t, when it says probability, it's referencing the total area in your tails, which is alpha, right? So I would still tell it alpha, but now it'll divide it by two for me, right? Before with the t dot iv, remember I was dividing alpha by two. So, you know, I guess it saves me a little bit of time, 
so that I don't have to tell it alpha over two. It'll divide alpha by two for me. And then it always returns to me the positive value. So that's that's a little bit of a difference with that that t dot i and b dot two t. You can use that um, for your your two tailed test. It's really whichever one you're you're more okay with. I usually just start out with a t dot i and b because it kind of matches up with how we would do it by hand. I mean, we have to, uh, when we do it by hand, we can't like black box things and then have you know the computer do it for us without a sync. So, any questions on that? Keep keep going here. All right, so and I'm going to label this critical value approach because we can also do the p-value approach. Right? So we can copy this down, kind of show you we can find the p-value and then do an if statement there as well. Hopefully they line up, right? So when we were doing this p-value, we had a problem when we worked with the student t-distribution. Remember, we could only find it like six values from the table. So we can only put the p-value in a certain range. It's not true if we use Excel, right? We're not limited. So the p-value for a two-tailed test, remember, we found what? A test statistic of negative 4.05. So the p-value would be the area to the left of that or being further away from that assumption value. But for a two-tailed test, it would have been equally as likely to see something that went against the assumed true value on the other side as well. So we can use that t dot i and v to find, or sorry, we can use a certain function to find the area in this left tail, but we then have to remember that's only half of our p-value, so we still needed to multiply by two, right? When we were doing these by hand. So what function can we use in Excel? Well, now we know the t-value and we wanna find the area in the tail. So instead of working in the inverse, we're going to be just using that regular t dot dist function. Okay. So t dot dist will tell us if we give it the test statistic or that t value, it'll give us that area in that lower left tail. So here's my test statistic, comma. Oh, yeah, we'll need to know my degrees of freedom. So n minus one, comma. And then we always make it cumulative. Like if we don't make it cumulative, I don't. It has no use for us. I don't even know why it's an option, right? We're always going to use this as a cumulative distribution. So we're always looking for the area to the left. Okay. Now, once I find that, right, if that function looks up this t value and then tells me the probability I see that or anything below it, well, I couldn't do that from my regular table, right? Because if I try to go down to my degrees of freedom of 6,000, first of all, I'm going to have to estimate. And then second of all, Right. I, oh, sorry. Second of all, I have to find, even if I estimate with this last row, it doesn't have 4.05 on here. Right. So I can't really do this by hand, but I can do it in Excel. Excel will look up that T value at this degrees of freedom and give us the problem of seeing that or anything to the left of it or anything less than it. Okay. Any questions there? What's the last step I need to do here for this two-tailed test? If I get the area in this left tail, my total p-value is the area in both these tails. So I still need to multiply it by two for a two-tailed test. Now, if this was just a left-tailed test, evidence on the other side doesn't go against the null. But once I find the area in the left tail, I'm done. That is my p-value, right? But because it's a two-tailed test, evidence on either side could go against the null. I have to remember I've got a tail on the other side equally as large or has the same value, the same probability. So I need to multiply it by two. Okay. Any questions on this? So no surprise, this should be pretty small. Five, you know, 0 0.03 e to the negative five means move that decimal point five places to the left. So 0 0.00005. So remember, what was our p-value rejection decision? If our p-value is less than alpha that we set, we're okay rejecting. So once again, I have something that I want to check to see if it's true. So I can use that if statement. If my p-value is less than alpha, that's all I want to do, right? If the p-value is less than alpha, comma, put in the word reject. 
If it's not, put in the words, fail to reject, right? I personally, if I'm doing this, the p-value approach is a little bit easier because I don't have to use those absolute values, right? I'm just comparing probability. So like I never have to worry about directions like with a left, right, or two-tailed test. So usually I, I would do the rejection decision using the p-value and alpha as opposed to using the critical value and the test statistic, right? But either one should give us the exact same rejection decision. Right? So sure enough, both of them tell me to reject. Yep, I can leave it up there. I just kind of <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> Any questions on that before we keep moving here? Okay. All right. So you know, I could play around and see like different things like I could reject or fail. So I can reject 14.3 as the true mean age for when someone starts, you know, first starts tries an e-cigarette, right? Which the fact that I can reject that and have sample evidence is lower than that may be alarming to some, right? Um, but I can play around with this. Can I reject 14.25, right? You'll notice everything updates. I can't quite reject that, right? Not at the 99% confidence level. And, you know, I could play around with this value a bunch. I could play around with the alpha. And this always should be updating. And both ways should give me the same rejection decision. Okay. Any questions on that before we keep moving here? A couple more things I want to show you before we get out of here. So just like that t.i and v.2t, there is a slight shortcut that we can use for the p-value as well which is t dot dist dot, oops, to t, right? So instead of, you know, when I was using the critical value approach to look at the critical values, I had to divide alpha by two because I had half of alpha in each tail. Well, now when I find the area in one tail to get my total p-value, I had to multiply by two because I had two tails. I'm just working in the opposite direction. So what the t dot dist dot to t will do is it looks up this test statistic, right? It calls it x at comma, our degrees of freedom, and it'll multiply it by two for us, right? So it's t dot dist dot two t, we tell it our test statistic, just like we did before, then comma, what our degrees of freedom is, and it'll basically find the area in that lower left tail and multiply it by two for us. So I should get the same answer here, but I get an error, right? So the reason why is because the people at Microsoft, I don't know, I don't know why they don't fix this, but this function will only take positive values, which is dumb because for a two-tailed test, you could have evidence on either side. So you might have a negative test statistic, you might have a positive test statistic. They could add one line of code that checks to see if that's true. And then, you know, if it's negative, it finds the area in the lower left tail multiplied by two. If it's positive, it would find the area in the upper right tail multiplied by two, but they haven't done that, right? So if you want to use this t.dist.2t, you have to make sure that you have a positive test statistic in there. So we have to take the absolute value. Now it doesn't matter, right? Because the area to the left of negative 4.05 is the same as the area to the right of positive 4.05. But for whatever reason, the way they have it written, the function written, it only accepts positive values there, okay? So now when I hit enter, hopefully I get the same p-value I did when I actually like found the area in the left tail and multiplied it by two myself, right? Sure enough, we get the same value. So you can do either one, uh, whichever one kind of is a little bit easier for you to understand. Like I said, I, I sometimes will have people forget that this has to be positive and they get really frustrated. This way kind of lines up with more of how you'd have to do it by hand. And so generally that's why I show that way first. Okay. Any questions on anything up to this point? Okay. So I want to try to make one more point since we're in Excel here. So let's assume I have the same hypothesis test. I find the same sample mean variance, but let's assume I found this exact same sample mean, right? But I found it from a smaller sample. Like this sample is huge, right? So it makes it really easy to reject the null. But let's say I had a smaller sample size. Like let's say this was only from 50 people. Well, what's that going to do to the standard deviation of my sample means? Or that's what's in my denominator, right? Well, 
Well, if this gets smaller, that standard deviation is going to be larger. My distribution, my sample means will be more spread out. So seeing the same sample evidence, right, and having the same hypothesis test, if this denominator is now smaller, that same, or sorry, if this denominator is now larger, that same difference will be a smaller number of standard deviations away, or dividing by a larger number will decrease that test statistic. Our test statistic, or our t-value, telling us the number of standard deviations away that we are from that assumed true mean. So if I go in here and just like hypothetically, if I found the same sample evidence but from a much smaller sample size, what's going to happen to that, that t-value? Well, it's going to get smaller, which remember, here's my rejection decision for the critical value approach. If my test statistic is getting smaller, it's going to be less likely I can reject the null. So seeing the same sample evidence, but if it was from a sample size of 50 here, I actually couldn't reject that null hypothesis, right? So this kind of highlights the fact that large sample sizes, even finding the same difference between my sample mean and the assumed true mean, allows me to actually be able to reject that, right? And I can be like pinpoint down where this true population mean is a lot, a lot more precisely. Excuse me. Any questions over anything that we have here in Excel? You want to see something again? Okay. So um, on Wednesday, I'll probably start out. We'll do a little bit more in Excel. I'll probably show you how this would work if we did have a, a known population variance. Or maybe I'll show you how we would do it with proportions where we're using the standard normal distribution. And maybe I'll do like a left or right tail test just so we get a little bit different, different you know, example. Um, actually, I already have it on here. What is it? Right tail test, right? And we'll do the sample proportional one. I think we'll work through that. Um, that'll be helpful. And then we'll start looking at two populations. So instead of just having a population mean and saying, is it different than a certain value? We're gonna be looking at the difference between two groups sample means, right? So in our example today, right? We had a pretty large test statistic, pretty small p-value. So when it comes to rejecting the null, right, got 99 problems, but rejecting the null hypothesis they want. So I'll leave you with that. If you have any questions on those test corrections, please reach out. I want you guys to get as many points back as possible. Um, on Wednesday, I'll probably put up the first connect assignment related to population examples. But other than that, I will see you guys on Wednesday. Yes. Uh, here, actually, uh, remind me to say, I'll probably say something on Wednesday. Somebody has a bracket that I, it's still very good, but if Duke and Kansas both would have won and then Duke would have won it all, I think they might have had one of the best brackets in the country. They were already at 97 percentile, but that was, now that Duke lost, they're not going to be as high. I looked at it like recently because I got Kansas going with the My bracket was pretty bad, so a lot of you guys need I think both percentiles I would. There's a couple that were really high. There's a couple in the 90s. I was 87%. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. And my other one was 63, and then another one was 63. <laughs> so the one I submitted for you was 387. Yeah, you definitely.